Hello there and welcome to today's message from Lossie Baptist Church in Scotland. We really hope and pray that this is a blessing to you wherever or whenever you're listening to it. Good evening. Uh, it's good to be together. I missed you this morning as I was out in Hopeman, but uh, it was lovely to be there, but lovely to be back with you tonight. We're continuing our series. Uh, we've been working through Ephesians, really seeing it as the blueprint of the church, church and new society. This whole uh, concept, this reality where Paul's writing this letter to the church in Ephesus, and really in writing it to Ephesus, it's around to the churches in Asia Minor, when he's putting out really his blueprint of what the church needs to look like. And we've hit really a very practical section that we've been looking at here in uh, Ephesians 4, and we'll probably be touching into uh, Ephesians 5 as well tonight, although we'll see how we get on. Uh, We saw it was very practical last week, and we will see it's very practical this, uh, tonight as well. And we gave it this title, The Good, the Bad, and the Beautiful, which was indeed a total steal from a Western. And it was my small attempt to help us to see what Paul is showing when he reveals the gospel to us. It's really important that we don't come to four and miss everything that's come before it. Of course, one, two, and three comes before four, mathematically, helpfully, and also in our letter. You see, it's easy to think that going to church is a good way to become a better person. I'm sure there's an element of truth in that, sometimes. But the idea is that it'll teach us some morals. It'll teach you how to be nice. It's a good grounding for life. That's why some people used to send their children off to Sunday school, and they had no interest themselves in going to church. Maybe it was that or an hour and a half away from the kids. Either way. They used to send their kids off for a good grounding. Others, we saw, might say that they are too bad to even enter the church. You've ever heard the joke people say, if I walk into church, oh, the roof will fall in. And I always want to say to them, test it. Test it and see. And when the roof doesn't fall in, come and have a seat with us. 
And you might come and read some of the lists that Paul makes in this passage, and you'll say, well, I do some of those things, but not all of them, so I won't be welcomed here. But the gospel is the beautiful part. It's not about how good you are. It's not about how bad you are. It's about how beautiful God is. And the gospel is the wonderful news of what he has done in making us beautiful. So we said it like this last week. The church is where bad people go because God is good and he makes us beautiful. And you say, who's a bad person? Well, the Bible would say, you're a bad person and I'm a bad person. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. And so when we say bad people, what we mean is the church is where all people go because God is good. And in God's goodness, he makes us beautiful. You don't get better by trying in your own strength. This whole thing is about what God does. Certainly God does it in cooperation with us. We don't sit back and be lazy, but we don't do it in our own strength. We do it because only God can really change our hearts. You can be nicer to people from the outside, but we can't be a changed person without God doing the work that only he can do. And this evening we're going to see, it's when we get closer to Jesus, that he makes us more like him. But be warned, time served is not a guarantee of experience. Maturity is the mark of a Christian. And here Paul is listing what maturity and, in the opposite, what immaturity looks like. But maturity doesn't come with age. It comes with spiritual growth. That's why some people can be in the church two years and be far more mature than someone's been in the church 20 years. Why? Because it's not time served. It's not the date on your membership book. It's your spiritual growth. However early that spiritual, uh, that membership certificate might be, Joel, as you caught my eye, congratulations this morning. And to Logan. That's why at the very core of Christianity, it's not about being good. That undersells the beauty of the gospel. Christianity is about living in the goodness of what the Spirit has already made you to be. That's really a great summary of the Christian faith. It's about living in the goodness of what the Spirit has already made you to be. So with that in mind, let's turn to Ephesians 4. For those using the Blue Bibles, you'll find it in page 978. For those who are here and don't have a Bible, Make any one of these your Bible, unless it's in someone else's hands. Take it, and we'd love you to have God's Word available to you. So please take full advantage of that. We're going to start in verse 25, where we left off, eh, where we picked up, sorry, last week. And we'll read into verse 2, just in case we get that far, for ourselves. We'll be picking up in in, uh, teaching from where we left off in verse uh, 29, but we'll read 25. So Ephesians chapter 4, beginning at verse 25. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry, remember that's righteous anger, and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, that's unrighteous anger, and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. And we're picking up from tonight. Let no corrupting talk come out your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Amen. God's word to us tonight. Let's pray as we come before it. Lord and Heavenly Father, once again we come before your word. Once again we recognize the depths of its riches. 
And we ask, Lord, that, that you would do a work in us. Our longing, and, and I pray it's the longing of everyone here tonight, is that we would be growing spiritually and that we become mature believers. Lord, whether we've been in the church for the first time or the millionth time, our longing, whether we're here now or watching later, as those who are housebound and unable to be with us, Lord, please help us to always have in our heart a desire to be like you and growing, not only in our understanding of you, but in the way we live with you. That, Lord, people could see by our walk and our talk that you are Lord. And we ask these things in your holy and your precious name. Please help us not to waste these opportunities that for all eternity we'll look back and regret if we come but don't listen, if we hear but don't apply. Help us to be doers of the word for your glory and for your name. Amen. Last week, we looked at three aspects of this new life into which Paul begins to describe to us. He taught us about speaking the truth with each other, which obviously was the good, about putting away falsehood, which was the bad, because we are members of one another, which was the beautiful, the beautiful being the fact that we are a church. We are members one of another. Paul told us that we have a righteous anger, but we have to be very careful that it doesn't turn into unrighteous anger, giving no opportunity for the devil to get a foothold in our life, and we saw Paul speak about honest work, which was good, and no longer stealing as the thief did, which is bad, in order that we have something rightly earned by us that can be shared with anyone in need, and that was the beautiful. And now Paul's returning from hands to speech, having previously spoken about telling the truth. Now Paul looks at the words that we use. Verse 29, let no corrupting talk come out your mouths but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. That word corrupting is the word used for rotting. I've put up a, a picture of a rotting apple, at least in the mirror, but on the outside it looks shiny and good. And that, that can sometimes testify to our experience of church. What we've really learned is how to behave well on a Sunday. If we really look in the mirror, there may be rotten words festering away in our minds and festering away in our speech, festering away when we're with other people who aren't church people so we can say what we really think. When an apple is rotten, it's no longer good for you. It's a bit of a fight in our house because I don't believe in sell-by dates, but there's a level of rottenness of an apple that even I wouldn't eat. I think only my father would eat. He eats disgusting things. Well beyond healthy. His immune system must be incredible. But a rotten apple isn't going to bring you any nutrients. It's not going to be good for you at all. And it's a great description, isn't it, of corrupting talk. Paul says, when your rotten speech comes out your mouth, which is the bad again, it doesn't help anyone. But instead, it's going to make you ill. It's not healthy, it's not edifying, it's rotten. Instead, dedicate your mouth to building each other up, not tearing each other down. Speak in a way that fits the occasion. I love that little phrase. I've been, been reflecting on that. What on earth Paul was talking about when he decides to add in this thing of speak, speak in a way that fits the occasion. And I was thinking about sometimes, maybe out of glibness, or just out of our own selfishness, we miss the opportunity of a conversation. We maybe have an opportunity to encourage someone, but we miss the opportunity because we had made a joke instead. You know, our desire to have a good punchline was so good that we missed any opportunity to say something actually meaningful. Or our gratitude is missed because we're just thinking about ourselves. And, and maybe even if someone's coming to us and saying what a hard week they had, and all you're waiting to do is get the chance to tell them how hard your week's been. And it becomes like a kaplunk competition going on of who's had the worst week. Speak in a way that fits the occasion. Look for opportunities in every conversation you have to build each other up and not tear each other down. Really listen to the person speaking to you. And as appropriate, build them up. Fitting words are gracious words. 
They glorify God before each other, and they witness well to those who have no concept of who God is and his glory. Do you know that you have the power to add grace into people's lives as they listen to you? And you have the opportunity, too, to add misery. So don't miss the opportunity to add grace. Healthy speaking reflects our healthy God. And healthy words come from a healthy heart. And of course, we get a healthy heart from God himself. Healthy speaking reflects a healthy God. And healthy words come from a healthy heart. It's a good test when we speak to ourselves, eh, to others, to ask ourselves, are our words building up or tearing down? Is it fitting to the occasion? And is it gracious? Now that doesn't mean that we can never speak truth about something that needs to be addressed. Absolutely not. So long as when we do do that, we speak the truth in love. But do you also hear the the other side of that? And one side we say, well, it's not always going to be words that are building up when we have to call something out, although that is the end purpose. It, It will also always fit the occasion, but it might not always sound gracious. But hear the other side of that when we say it should be the exception. It should be the exception. If you're always tearing down, chances are it's not because it's fitting the occasion It's because you like to tear down. And so in the moments when we have to speak out in a way that maybe isn't building up, it should be an exception. Gracious words should be the norm. Building up should be the default. Love is always the standard. And yet this isn't just about living in the unity God has created. This is about living with God himself. Look at verse 30. Some serious words, easily overlooked. Verse 30 says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. You know, it's certainly true that we behave differently at times if we had a better awareness day to day of the fact that God sees our every action, which he does, hears our every word and even our every thought, he does. But we forget that. We forget God's presence so often (laughs) in our lives and how it would be different if we remembered his presence at all times. But Paul goes further than God just being present. By his own spirit, he lives within you. You know, the spirit is firstly the seal over us that we are saved. The spirit's first job is to convict you of your sin. He wants you to know that that your standard and your life doesn't live up to him. And at some point, every single one of us who has turned to Jesus as our Lord and Savior has had to recognize that we need to be saved from who we are. Saved from the corruption of our heart, for the sinfulness of our actions, for our separation from God. And yet wonderfully with the gospel, as the same spirit comes and convicts us of sin, he also reveals to us the good news that Jesus Christ is our very hope. The Spirit comes and says, you are not living up to the standards of God, and yet salvation is not by your efforts, but by God's grace. And so secondly, not only does he reveal uh, our conviction of sin to us, but he also reveals that he is our seal of our salvation, that we can have the reassurance that we are saved. The rebuke of God always comes with the reassurance alongside. And with that reassurance also comes a seal of our future redemption. That what God has begun in us, he will one day bring to completion. And we'll receive our full inheritance from him. Right now, the Spirit has graciously set up his home in us. He makes our bodies temples of God because of his dwelling presence. And notice when we talk about the Holy Spirit, and we all slip up on this, I think almost all of us slip up on this, myself included. I did it a couple of weeks ago. We talk about the Holy Spirit as he and not an it. I caught myself a couple of weeks ago saying it about the Holy Spirit and had to catch myself. It's easy to do. It's sometimes easy to slip into that language, but the Holy Spirit isn't an it. He's a he. He's a person. 
He's the third person of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And as a person, he can be offended. You know, previously, we looked at the fact in the, in the last couple of verses, as we read, we're to make no room for the devil, but we're also not to grieve the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit can be grieved. He can be hurt. And he's hurt when we refuse to live in step with him. As Paul says in Galatians 5, and I kind of picture of here, and I like the picture here. It's maybe not, oh, it's gone. The minute you talked about it, it disappeared. There it is, back again. So this picture I quite liked because it's lots of people who are coming together to make the form of a dove. And I love that because the people are being conformed to the image of the dove, not the dove being conformed to the image of the people. I thought that was a slightly good representation here of what it's like as we live in the Spirit. Since He is our source of life, we are to walk by the Spirit in step with the Spirit. That's what's pleasing to God. It honors God. And it honors what he's done to set us free from our old life. And when we resist him, we resist his righteousness. We in actual fact grieve him. And as a warning to us, some of us have maybe become comfortable or callous or forgetful of how painful it is to grieve the Holy Spirit. You know, there's, there, there's something... We've talked about it a few times now, but there's, there's something about patterns that build into our lives where we stop even thinking about how God feels about it. That we get so used to these behaviors in our lives that we are almost numb to the reality that, that the Spirit himself is grieved. And so Paul continues, verse 31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Get rid of that which grieves God, Paul's saying. Don't let bitterness take over your heart. Bitterness consumes. It takes up all your thinking. It takes up all your energy. It steals all your joy. Bitterness sours everything that it comes into contact with. And we can get stuck in bitterness. It's Galatians that talks about the bondage of bitterness. What a great description Paul makes of that. Bound like chains in a jail cell. And the chains are made up of bitterness. We can find ourselves in a place where we don't want to forgive because we're so bound up in the pain. Wrath is similar in holding on to unforgiveness and pain, but it corrupts your thinking into wanting to get the satisfaction of seeing the other person get what you think they deserve. It doesn't leave room for God's wrath, as Paul says in Romans. In wrath, you want the satisfaction of seeing someone get their just deserts. And then here... Paul, once again, speaks about anger, but here very clearly we see it's unrighteous anger, not the righteous anger we thought about last week. Anger clouds judgments. It fogs our perspective, and it consumes us into acting in ways which are totally outside of what we know well find to be acceptable. Give yourself to anger, you'll end up doing things you would never do because you're caught up in the moment. What you notice about these attributes is that we act out of bitterness and wrath and anger in the hope that we'll feel better sharing a piece of our mind or getting some immediate justice or venting our frustration, but in reality, they never make the situation better. They're like that rotten apple. You never feel better after them. It only makes bad situations worse. And in contrast, forgiveness can seem so unfair Sometimes it feels like people get away with what they've done. But the reality is, and this is the key bit, pleasing the Holy Spirit is better than grieving Him. Whatever our circumstance might be, whatever our situation is, and some of us are in horrific circumstances, it's really important that we get more satisfaction 
in pleasing the Holy Spirit, then any satisfaction we might get other ways, which in actual fact will grieve him. And Paul continues and he brings in this word clamoring. And clamoring speaks about a loud voice where you want to be heard but not listened to. I remember going in to help in a school in my last church when I was pastor. I was a chaplain. And I would go into the school and they would often ask me to speak at the kids or something. And you would slowly notice the classroom getting louder and louder and louder. I don't know if you've ever experienced this kind of experience and actually feeling somewhat helpless <laughs> to control it. You know, shh, quiet, quiet, listen to what I'm saying. But, but as more kids spoke, other kids wanted to be heard over each other. They weren't even talking to me. They were just talking to each other. But by the end of it, the, the kids were like almost kind of shouting at each other because they all wanted to have a conversation and there was no anger involved in it. They just wanted to have a conversation. And, and the teacher came in and she says, oh, 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 I can't hear myself think. And immediately there was silence in the whole classroom. And I was raging. Because <laughs> I thought, no way. She said, 40 years of experience, Ram, don't worry. You know, off she went. All it took was a little word from her. But before that, I was trying to hold the, the class together. But as they were speaking, it just got louder and louder and louder without any intentionality. But just the kids naturally wanting to be heard over each other, whatever they were talking about, until they were all so loud. You couldn't even hear yourself. It's a bit chaotic. Similarly, arguments can go this way. People want to be heard but don't want to listen. It results in chaos of individuals shouting over each other. No place for clamor. Paul includes slander in his list. Slander has become a legal word in our society. If you prove someone slandered you, you prove they've damaged your reputation, typically of a company or something like that, and you get the loss of earnings that will follow as a, a suing as a result. It's the whole idea that someone has gone out of their way to ruin your reputation. <coughs> they aren't happy until your name is in tatters. And they find satisfaction when they can get other people to see the way you see it. And some people can put tremendous energy into that. And finally, in Paul's list, he adds, along with all malice. And if slander is wanting uh, people to see them in a bad light, malice is actively planning to see bad come their way. It's pretty serious. Maybe that's why Paul finished his little list on this. Malice is when bitterness has really taken hold of you and the desire for wrath turns into making actual plans and you start to actively seek what you think will be the comfort of the other pain. <coughs> It's a good indicator that you're far from forgiveness. And it's a good indicator that you're held captive by your anger. Put it all together and what you have is the reality that what you say matters. The way you say it matters. And the motive with which you say it matters. James spends whole sections talking about taming the tongue because it needs to be tamed. What you say matters. The way you say it matters. The motive with which you say it matters. And it takes us all back to the beautiful because what we see is that it matters because the Holy Spirit lives within you. So slow your words. <coughs> Choose your words carefully. And watch the motive of your heart. In contrast, the Holy Spirit looks like verse 32. Be kind to one another. <coughs> Tender-hearted. Forgiving one another. As God in Christ forgave you. You can kind of see that this is as much an attitude as it is a behavior. It's a difference between doing the good and living in the actual beauty of the gospel. You know, we aren't to pretend it never happened. We're to forgive one another. We're not just to avoid the person. We have to be kind to them and tender 
hearted. That's the difference between doing the good or avoiding the bad and living in the actual beauty of the gospel. You replace kindness before each other. This word actually sounds in the Greek a lot like Christ. The early Christians loved this word because it was so related to Christ-likeness. Christ was kind. We're to be tender-hearted, which is really to be compassionate. And we have to keep topping up our relationships with forgiveness. And when you feel like you can't forgive enough, you can look to God who forgave us in Christ. Remember a few weeks ago, we looked at how Peter asked Jesus how many times he had to forgive. As many as seven times. Jesus answers 70 times seven. Even then, it's not that we have to forgive 490 times. Jesus was saying, you're to keep on forgiving others and keep on forgiving as God keeps on forgiving you. Certainly, these are attitudes and they are learnt behaviors as we're taught by the Holy Spirit how to live according to His ways. And they become more natural with practice, but most of all, they reflect the Holy Spirit who lives within us. These actions live out the truth of the gospel by which God relates to us. We forgive because we're forgiven. We love because we're loved. We show compassion and kindness because God has first shown it to us. See, we need bigger hearts, don't we? When you see Jesus and he's exhausted and he just wants to escape and the crowd follow him, what does he have? He has compassion, tender-hearted on the crowd. When a woman who has had a bleed for years and she's spent every penny she can on a doctor and without permission she reaches out and grabs help, saying, if only I can touch his garment, I'll be healed. And Jesus turns and says, who touched me? And the disciples are saying, you're crushed in here, Jesus. Everybody touched you. I say, no, who touched me? When he sees a woman, he doesn't say, how dare you? He has compassion on her. It says, your faith has made you well. Jesus has a big heart. An immeasurable heart. And we're called to see the world through his eyes. Don't choose malice over kindness. Don't choose slander over compassion. Don't choose bitterness over forgiveness. You're invited here to make God your first love. To make pleasing him greater joy than our own satisfaction. And hey, do you know what? I guarantee you, you'll find greater satisfaction anyway. But it's not for your own satisfaction. Do it for the Lord. It should grieve us to grieve the Holy Spirit. When the choice comes, the heart is always going to be revealed. You might discover that you are choosing good so people think you're a good person. It's all about image. It's all about that picture of the apple which hides behind the mirror. It looks shiny and beautiful because you've learned how to look good. In which case, looking good becomes vital. And when people stop believing you're a good person, you're going to revert back to all your old behaviors. As long as people play along with the charade that you're a good guy, you'll be a good guy. But if anyone pointed out a weakness in you, woe betide you. Suddenly, other behaviors come to light. Why? Because you were never being good for the glory of God. You were being good so you would look like a good guy and get the reward of people saying, you're a good guy. When the choice comes, the heart is revealed. Others might be less bad in the hope that we might feel better about our past. But that's not really finding peace with the hurt we've caused in the past. We're never going to earn our way out of our sins. But forgiveness is available. Or we do the good now in the hope of some kind of idea of karma or whatever, that God will maybe pay us back by giving us good health and wealth and safety because we've been pretty well behaved, God. Why would you punish me? But the minute something hard comes your way, you're going to be angry with God. How dare you? 
How long have I been going to church, Lord? How long have I been serving you, Lord? And you, you let this happen to me? When the choice comes, the hearts reveal. Real living. Like living, living life to the fullest. Living life as it's meant to be lived in its goodness and its beauty and its delight. That comes when we're delighted that God's spirit lives in us. Not just in the future, in the new heavens and the new earth, but right now. That we just delight living in the beauty of this new life because of the beauty of living in this new life. When God becomes enough, then we're equipped for all of life. Good, bad, easy, hard. Whatever comes our way, if God is enough, God who will always be with us will be right with us to give us a strength to give us a perspective, to give us the hope, even if it is, to say, Lord, whatever I'm going through now, I know it won't be forever. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's the question. Are you living? Are you living in the beauty of a life in the Spirit? Paul flows into chapter 5. He continues to unpack this righteous living when he calls us to be imitators of God as beloved children. Therefore, in light of all that God is offering you, imitate God because of who you are. His children that he loves. Now, this is a lovely thing to hear, but it's really about your identity. Do you know who you are? Have you understood what's happened to you when you came to Christ? That you moved from children of wrath, as Paul describes in Ephesians 2, to children of God. From life to death. From darkness to light. Do you see how Paul connects it in verse 1? And I'll, I'll finish on verse 1. I won't go to verse 2 just for time. But in verse 1, he says, Therefore, be imitators of God. Why? As beloved children. In light of who you are, in light of who God has made you to be, live imitating him. A great transformation has taken place in your life. You have been born again, as Jesus describes in the Gospel of John. Born again of the Spirit. You are now a child of the one who through him all things were made. The one who is the beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega, the source of life, our eternal God is now our loving heavenly Father. And although we have every right to grieve in the grieving times and to be sorrowful in the losses, there is nothing more that we could ask of God that he's already given to us. And if we understand that, then we understand what it's to behave like God. Let me do verse two. I'll do it quickly. I'll repeat it again next week. But verse two says, walking in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Love is the driver that brought Jesus from heaven to earth. The master who became a servant. The creator who became created. It was love that marked the life of Jesus. All the ways that he had compassion. All the ways that he was kind and tender. Ultimately, he laid down his own life as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. And the invitation really finishes on this double play in verse 2. Where we are invited to be a fragrant offering to God. Christ has paid the price once and for all, but we're invited to join in that worship by also being a fragrant offering. And I've asked a cheeky question. What do you smell like? What do you smell like? Now, there are two ways you can answer that. You can do this. Yep, thanks, Edward. 
or you can look into your heart. And you can actually start to think about that the choices we make reveal the health of our hearts. See, tonight, if you're in a pretty good mood and everything's going pretty well, I'm sure you're very lovely. But when the tension comes and choices have to be made, we reveal what's at our hearts. Is your life a fragrant offering to Christ? Because that's all that matters. My opinion about you doesn't matter. The person on your right and your left's opinion of you doesn't matter. But God's opinion of you, that matters everything. Grieving the Holy Spirit, that's the most serious thing we can talk about. But far from grieving the Holy Spirit, we see this list of Paul, which is not a list of how to be a good boy and get a present and not a bad boy and get a lump of coal. But it's a description of the church in all of its beauty. And Paul says, in light of all that God has made you to be, and by his spirit living within you, you are invited to respond in a life that is like a fragrant offering to God. Because it reflects his goodness and his beauty. That's the beautiful invitation you have. It takes hard work to look at our heart. It takes hard work to ask why we make bad choices. Because at the heart of it, there's always a reason. But it's worthy questions, worth being asked, in order that we might be in our lives a fragrant offering to God. And I can think of nothing better to dedicate my life to than being a fragrant offering to the Lord. Can you? And I can think nothing worse than grieving the Holy Spirit who has held back nothing from me, but not only forgiven me my sins, but given me life in all its beauty and eternity. And to receive all of that and to respond in grieving him is worse than being a spoiled child. And we'll see it's serious as we unpack chapter 5 a bit further on. How do you smell? Let's pray together. <clears throat> Lord, we know that no one lives up to this list, that each one of us needs that great work of your Spirit in our lives to be the compassionate, tender-hearted, kind, loving, forgiving people that we know it gives glory to you. But Lord, we know as well that we can't just do it through sheer hard work, but by that transformation and that, that life in cooperation with your Spirit, by your grace that lives within us and makes our very bodies temples to you. Lord, help us to see the areas where we grieve you and work in us to grow our hearts that even when we're exhausted and just want to escape, we might have compassion on the crowds. And when people reach out and grab from us, we might just see the opportunity to bless. And that with our words, as we slow down and watch our words and watch the motive of our words, we might build up instead of tearing down. But most of all, as good as all these works are, we pray that in the beauty of the gospel, in living in the beauty of that gospel, in step with your spirit, we might be a fragrant offering. That as you smell what we offer in our words and our deeds and our givings, it would be a pleasing aroma in your heavenly places. Lord, that's what we long for. Give us hearts that grow to love, to please you, and hearts that pull away from anything that grieves you. Because, Lord, it's for you that we live this life. And it's for your glory that we want to. And we ask all these things by the help of your Spirit, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, and by your great plan 
in which you're unfolding your wonderful plan of salvation. Amen. Let's spend a few moments um, <clears throat> in worship just responding to that. Please would you stand and sing with us. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled died for me I see his words his hands his feet my savior on that cursed tree his body bowed and drenched in tears they lay 